gratitude session 2014, third talk. When you are grateful, you share. Our life is flowing by so quickly. Last year there were 52 weeks, 365 days, 8,760 hours approximately. 36,792,000 heartbeats. And how many of those do we actually remember? How many of those little snippets? If we take just even one small part, like New Year's Eve, everybody knows we had New Year's Eve. And New Year's Eve alone, we can't remember all the places or the thoughts or the feelings or the people or the conversations or the actions that happened. It's all gone. It's all the nature of memory. Memory comes, exists, and disappears. Our whole world is like that. This is what <clears throat> the great uh, Hindu teacher, Sri Nisargadatta, says. He was a, uh, a very famous Hindu teacher in the last uh, century. He wrote, um, or his talks were collected into a book called I Am That. Here, here's the, the series of questions and answers by Maharaja. Some say the world is real. Others that it has no being whatsoever. What do you, what's true? And Nishigardata says, which world are you inquiring about? Well, the world of my perceptions, of course. The world you perceive is a very small world indeed. The world you perceive is a very small world indeed. And it's entirely private. Take it to be a dream and be done with it. How can I take it to be a dream? The dream does not last. Well, how long will your own little world last? Question. After all, my little world is but a part of the total. Mahara, Mahara. Mr. Gardata. It is not the idea of a total world, a part of your personal world. That is, we see the world through our eyes. The idea of the personal of the whole world is an idea we have in our own mind. Is not the idea of a total world it's a part of your personal world, your personal view. The universe does not come to tell you that you are part of it. It is you who have invented a totality to contain you as a part. It is you who have invented a totality. In fact, all you know is your own private world. However well you have furnished it with your imagination and expectation. In fact, all you know is your own private world. That world, of course, is nothing but memory. Question, surely perception is not imagination. Mr. Gurdada, what else? Perception is recognition, is it not? Something entirely unfamiliar can be sensed, but can't be perceived. Perception involves memory. That is, we hear the sound, and immediately we recognize the sound. This is the sound of wood or somebody's hand hitting. You see, this is on the podium. That's the perception he's talking about. Question. Granted, but memory does not make it an illusion. Mr. Gurdada. Perception, imagination, expectation, anticipation, illusion are all based on memory. Perception, imagination, expectation, anticipation, illusion are all based on memory. There are hardly any borderlines between them. They just merge into each other. All are responses of memory. Still, memory is there to prove the reality of the world. Memory is there to prove the reality of the world. Isn't that so, he asked? Mr. Gardada says, well, how much do you actually remember? 
try to write it down from memory, what you were thinking or saying or doing on the 30th of last month. And of course, when we try to do that, largely there's a blank. And the questioner says, yes, there's a blank there. Well, right. Mr. Gurdata says, yes, it's not as, but it's not as complete as you think. That is, the blank is not as complete as you think, because you do remember a lot. Unconscious memory, which we call fixed views, makes the world in which you live so familiar. We have all these fixed views that we're living in. Fixed views about ourself, our practice, our body. And because we have these fixed views and we keep encountering our own fixed views over and over again, it seems familiar. They're just our fixed views. Question. Admitted that the world in which I live is subjective and par partial. What about you, Maharishi, Maharaji? Oh, I can't remember whether it's Maharishi or Maharaji. What about you? In what kind of world do you live? Mr. Gurdata says, my world is just like yours. I see, I hear, I feel, I think, I speak, and I act in a world I perceive, just like you. But with you, it is all. That is, your view is everything. With me, that view is almost nothing. Knowing the world to be a part of myself, I pay it no more attention than you pay to the food you have eaten. While being prepared and eaten, the food is separate from you, and your mind is on it. Once swallowed, you become completely, totally unconscious of it. I have eaten up the world and need not think of it anymore. That is, I am one with the world. Everything I see and perceive is just my own mind. I am not inside here some little homunculus, and the world is not something out there. Question, well, doesn't that make you completely irresponsible? Mr. Gradata, how could I be? How could I hurt something in which is one with me? On the contrary, without thinking of the world, whatever I do will be a benefit to it. Just as the body seats itself aright, unconsciously, so I am ceaselessly active in setting the world aright. Nevertheless, you are aware of the immense suffering of the world. Of course I am, much more so than you are. And what do you do? I look at it through the eyes of God and find that all is well. Look at it through the eyes of God and find that all is well. In a way, this is what we're asking people to do during Sushin is not to look at themselves as this small, defective, broken creature, but to look at their process, look at their life, look at their being, in, in his terms, through the eyes of God, in our terms, through awareness itself, and see that all is well. You are not broken. And we come to Sushin, and it's just like he says, we come to Sushin, we can't remember all the thoughts and the food and the drinks and everything else that brought us here. We can't remember all of the minutes of all the decisions that brought us here. We can't even remember from yesterday all the waves of emotion, all the feelings of the easy and the hard, all the stuff that just went sweeping through we can't really remember it. All the moments of ease, all the moments of brightness, all the moments of just neutral perception, we can't remember all that. And so we have two choices. Either we just say, OK, it's all a dream. This is what's really important. This is what's really important. This has no valence, has no charge to it. It's just this, just this, just this, this bright, luminous moment. Or we start making up a whole bunch of stories. The story of my first day of Sashin, the story of my first day of summer camp, the story of my first, the story, the story, the story. And then we have a story of the first day, and a story of the second day, and a story of the third day, and a story of the fourth day, and a story of the fifth day. And if you're here long enough, you can make up a story about 72 days of Sashin. The story of my 70 first day of Sashin. What was that like? Hmm? These stories, we think, at the time we're telling them, we think they're so real. 
We make them up. We tell them to ourselves. We believe them. We, we tell them to ourselves over and over again. Oh, woe is me. 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 And then we start believing them, even though we forget them. We start believing them, and we start acting as if they're real. And we walk around like a crippled duck. Common story, I can't do it, I'm a failure, I'm inadequate, I'm incomplete. It's just a story. It has nothing to do with the nature of reality. It has nothing to do with it. It's just a, a temporary condition that we happen to encounter that doesn't happen to agree with our view. A story is basically we have a fixed view of how things should be. And when the world is working according to our fixed view, we think, yes, I'm wise, yes. Together. Yes, everything is going well. And when it doesn't agree with our fixed view, then we think, oh, what's wrong? Bad, 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 bad. And even, in fact, we tell ourselves stories is not a real problem because the stories all disappear. It's only if we keep telling ourselves the same story. One of the stories that we tell ourselves is that I am this particular body. I am this body, this temporary construction. You know, we all hear from scientifically that the cells in our body completely change in seven years. And all of us can look back a decade and think, where did that person go? They were so much stronger and lither and quicker, lighter. Where'd that person go? I wish they were back again. They were a temporary being passing through, just like the being we are right now is only a temporary being passing through our awareness. We are this composite, made of wholesome and defective parts. It's okay. It's the way it is. Or another story we tell ourselves is my temporary transient fickle, whimsical, inconsistent, unreliable, coming from nowhere thoughts are real. So I have this story I get made up out of my thoughts. And the story is somehow I'm an inadequate, unwholesome being. Somehow I'm, I'm, I'm poor in insight. I'm broken. I'm whatever, whatever particular story. It's just a bunch of thoughts that go through. And the thoughts are, they're, they're fickle, they're whimsical. They just go floating on through. And we grab a hold of them. We say, oh, they're telling me the truth. I must believe that. And then we begin acting like that. We do a whole workshop on the inner critic. The inner critic is just those inner critical thoughts that just say inadequate, 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 wrong. Da -da 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 -da. And they're just thoughts. They're not important. They have nothing to do with ultimate reality. They have nothing to do with our true nature. Nothing, zero, zip, to do with our true nature. They come from the same source as everything else. They return to the same source as everything else. So the first part of Sushen we keep coming to, is we come. We sit down, we have our particular method, our particular tool, our particular practice. And the practice and the method, the tool, whatever we want to call it, is a way of turning our attention away from these fixed views that we have, these stories that we're telling ourselves, to the constant shifting emptiness of this moment. Because it's only when our attention is actually on what is, without the story, we begin to, it begins to unfold. We actually begin to see the nature of our true self, the nature of our true life. But there's nothing wrong. Because it's important that we all have these obstacles and challenges. Otherwise, we would not have any compassion. Otherwise, we would not be able to help anybody else. Otherwise, we would really not know the nature of a difficult human life. But to both know the challenges, but also to see them as 
streamline. Both are important. Our generosity should increase in proportion to the obstacles placed before it. We often think about being generous, about feeling gratitude. And our impulse is that when we are full, we can be grateful. When we are full, we can be generous. But when we are not feeling so full, when we are feeling kind of small, when we're at the mercy of difficult thoughts, that's actually the most important time to be generous. And the place that we have to start with our gratitude, with our generosity, is with ourself. We have to offer ourselves patience, offer ourselves loving kindness, offer this imperfect being, dreamlike though it may be, love. And then we can offer that to all human beings. We have these stories that we tell over and over and over again of problems, of suffering, of challenges, of despair, of travails, of hard times. In a way, they can't be avoided. It's not about if I get rid of them all, if I just do something magical and make them all go away, then I'll be left with this bright, clear, pristine nature. It's rather we have to see the story-making of our own mind, the fixed views of our own mind, as transient, as temporary, to actually see through our hard times to that which is always present. So the challenges that we encounter both are dreamlike, not so important, and at the same time are the grist out of which a human life is made. They come from our own fixed beliefs. So if we're having a hard time, the universe doesn't care. The universe isn't having a hard time. We're having a hard time, and our hard time is basically showing ourselves to ourselves. Our hard times are basically showing ourselves our fixed beliefs. And when we turn our attention and turn our mindfulness right to the fixed beliefs and see them as transient thoughts and not as true, they don't bother us. So be generous with your patience, with your kindness, with your love. Be generous to this imperfect being and look carefully and see its true nature. It is most important to be generous when we have nothing to give. We have nothing to give and we're still generous. That counts for a lot. It's easy if we have a lot to give and we can give a a whole bunch and it doesn't take up so much space. But if we have very little to give and we still give, that makes a big difference. Those of you who've been around, we've done a lot of talks on vows, on life intention. The um, The best cauldron for life vows is hard times. If you can make your vow, if you can set your determination for awakening or whatever you want to do, when right in the middle of a very hard time, the vow becomes really important, becomes really strong. It means it goes down to the core. The same is true with generosity. If when you feel you have nothing to give and you still give, even when you feel you have nothing to be thankful for and you're still thankful, that goes right to the core. That goes deep. The more limited and broken we feel, the more powerful our act of generosity, our act of kindness, our act of appreciation can be. We have a guy at the uh, Dharma Center, the Heart of Wisdom Temple in Portland, who's homeless. Every time he comes, he gives a quarter, maybe a dollar, to our donation box. Every time. And he he often will beg, beg the money back, 
but he's always generous with the money that he's begged. I think it makes a big difference. Like somebody who's not very good at arithmetic wanting to help somebody else with basic arithmetic. They don't have to be a professor of math in order to help. One such person who has helped and helped when he was a young novice and really reached out and helped regardless of his particular, the overwhelming things that were confronting him is uh, Master Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh was born in October of 1926 in Vietnam. He was 88 this year. And as is natural, he is dying. He apparently had a stroke just recently. He's, his body is still technically alive, but um, the word out, the word is that he is definitely on his passing tour. Thich Nhat Hanh, um, as you all know, we have all been touched by his life. He is an exemplar of one person stepping forward. One person stepping forward and saying, this is important. Whatever I can offer, this is important. And his stepping forward has touched millions and millions of lives, especially all of ours. He was ordained as a monk in 1949, about 65 years ago. He had no real political or social experience but he saw the horrible suffering of the Vietnamese people and the foreign soldiers during the war. And he spoke and taught, organized. He was from his small beginnings. He was a young monk in a temple in rural Vietnam. And he had a practice of generosity, a practice of mindfulness, a practice of loving kindness which is a kind of generosity. He probably, next to the Dalai Lama, is the most influential Buddhist teacher in the last 50 or 100 years. Interesting enough, both of them became world leaders because of the enormous suffering that they and their people endured. And we think our little problems are are big, you know, our problems on back hurts, my nose hurts, my arm hurts, my head hurts, my ankle hurts, you know, whatever our little sufferings are. But they saw genocide, this Dalai Lama did genocide of his people, millions of people being killed. And, the Dalai, and, and Thich Nhat Hanh saw all the hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese killed. And you can read about their, their stories. But because of those obstacles that they faced, because of those enormous challenges they faced, they came forward with generosity, with kindness, with thanksgiving, and affected the whole world. They turned their pain and the suffering of their people. And we are particular beneficiaries of both of their, their teachings. Thich Nhat Hanh, called Fay by his students, came to the U.S. first in 1960 to teach. And he went back to Vietnam at the beginning of the war, and he was exiled from Vietnam. I first encountered him in uh, 1965. Roshi Cap Lo was the um, um, su supporter or advocate. I think he, he encouraged him to come, and the, his first book was called Zen Keys. Zen Keys and Roshi Kaplo wrote the forward to it. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh learned French, Vietnamese, English, Chinese, Pali, Sanskrit, and Japanese. A scholar, wrote a hundred books, founder of the Order of Inner Being, peace activist, teacher, practitioner. He founded Plum Village in France, the European Institute for Applied Buddhist Studies in Germany, Deer Park Monastery in the USA, Blue Cliff Monastery in the USA, Magnolia Village in the USA. He founded monasteries in Vietnam, Parallax Press Publishing Company. 
He is the subject of many films, and he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King. And of course, it wasn't that he did all those things, but somehow he was able to inspire others. He was able to inspire his students to take up the Dharma, to embody the Dharma, and to go forth in their own inadequate way and support other people with uh, all the monasteries and temples and things that he's done around the world. In the Buddhist tradition, we, we, emphasize, we differentiate between um, appreciation and respect. Appreciation, respect, and gratitude. So <clears throat> we have appreciation and respect for things. We have appreciation and respect for the bowls that we eat with. We have appreciation and respect for our homes. We have appreciation and respect for the tools that we use, things that come into our lives temporarily. But gratitude is something that we have for life, for that which is alive for our teachers, parents, people who help to keep a society organized, for family, people who have helped us, who have grown us, who have supported us. We don't give offerings to our tools. We don't give offerings to our house. But we offer generosity, kindness, and gratitude to people. We might do it by making our home a place of peace or a place of wisdom, a place of practice like we do at the, our home here at the monastery. It is seeing people and seeing our own humanity and seeing the humanity of great beings like Thich Nhat Hanh is what Session is all about. So Thich Nhat Hanh is in the process of dying. Well, he may be dead. We don't I'm not sure exactly what his situation is. And here are some things that he wrote. This is from a book called No Death, No Fear. It was written in 2002, about 12 years ago. And what he says applies to Sashin. For many of us, our greatest pain is caused by our notions of coming and going. Coming of good times, going of good times, coming of bad times, going of bad times. Coming of people, going of people. He continues, we think that the person we loved came to us from somewhere and has now gone away somewhere. But our true nature is the nature of no coming and no going. We have not come from anywhere. We shall not go anywhere. When conditions are sufficient, we manifest. When conditions are no longer sufficient, we no longer manifest. It does not mean that we do not exist. Like radio waves without a radio, we do not manifest. We are trying during Sashin to see all the passing phenomena is passing phenomena. And to know that which does not pass. Awareness itself. Awareness itself. Our true nature. Awareness itself has not come from anywhere. Awareness itself does not go anywhere. But in awareness, when conditions are sufficient, we manifest. In awareness, when conditions are no longer sufficient, we no longer manifest. Not only do the notions of coming and going not express reality, neither do the notions of being and non-being. We hear these words in the Prajnaparamita Sutra. That's the heart sutra that we, we do every morning. Listen, Shariputra, all dharmas are marked by emptiness. They are neither produced nor destroyed, neither increasing nor decreasing. Shariputra was the, the senior uh, disciple of the Buddha in the Pali Canon. He was the disciple most noted by wisdom. All dharmas are marked as empty. They are neither born nor destroyed. 
either increase or decrease. The meaning of emptiness here is very important. It means, first of all, to be empty of a separate self. Nothing has a separate self. Nothing exists by itself. This is what Sashin is about, fundamentally. All that we take ourselves as, this body, these emotions, this mind, the stuff in our lives, does not belong to me. It's just passing through. It's passing through our crystal clear, always bright awareness. And the body may have a hard time, so what? You know, the mind may have a hard time, but our awareness is crystal clear. So what we're doing with all the different practices that we're doing, it's not as though if I follow my breath perfectly and make absolutely no mistakes, have absolute complete attention throughout the entire breath, suddenly I get a big reward. Somebody will give me a big star and say, yes, congratulations. It's not about that. It's when we're able to begin to concentrate and to hold our awareness of what we want to, at that point, we can begin to turn our awareness onto awareness itself. The awareness of the breath, the awareness part, does not change. The breath goes up and down, easy and hard, slow and fast. Awareness is always present. And awareness is not something separate from the objects of awareness. Awareness and the objects of awareness are two sides of the same coin. But because we only see one half of it, we get very confused. Back to Thich Nhat Hanh. Nothing is a separate self. Nothing exists by itself. If we examine things carefully, we'll see that all phenomena, including ourselves, are composites. We're made up of other parts. We're made up of our mother and our father, our grandmothers and grandfathers, our body, our feelings, our perceptions, our mental formations, the earth, the sun, and innumerable non-self elements. All these parts depend on causes and conditions. We see that all that has existed, exists, or will exist, is interconnected and interdependent. All that we see has only manifested because it's part of something else, of other conditions that make it possible to manifest. All phenomena are neither produced nor destroyed because they're in the pro constant process of manifesting. We may be intelligent enough to understand this, but to understand it intellectually is not enough. To really understand this is to be free from fear. To really understand this is to be free from fear. And that's what the Heart Sutra that we chant in the morning says. And thus relieved all suffering, free from all fear, liberated. And that's what our practice is about, is looking, looking directly so that we see with our own, our own eye our inherent liberation, our inherent freedom, the unbrokenness of our essential nature. Hearing about it, thinking about it, is good. At least it gives us a direction to kind of shoot for. But it's nothing like tasting it. And we come to Sashin to taste it. Taste it directly. We have to practice looking deeply like this to nourish our awakened understanding of no birth and no death in our daily lives. In this way, we can realize the wonderful gift of non-fear. If we just talk about inner being as a theory, it will not help us. And we're, we're he and we're talking about two slightly different things. On one hand, he's saying all phenomena is composite, all phenomena is composed of you know, form, feelings, thought, choice, all the things that we know about. And I'm trying to enlarge it a little bit to say awareness itself is, no, is non-composed. Awareness itself has no composite parts. Awareness itself is not composed of anything. Awareness itself is just awareness. It does not come and go. Phenomena is always transforming. Phenomena always comes together as composite parts. 
we are always transforming. Transformation itself is constant, does not come and go. Transformation itself, the dreamlike nature of reality, is constant in awareness. If we just talk about inner being as a theory, it will not help us. We should ask, we could ask, a piece of paper, where do you come from? Who are you? What did you come here to do? Where are you going? We could ask a flame. Flame, where do you come from? Where will you go? If we inquire and we look deeply, deeply, deeply into the nature of our own mind that is aware of flame and paper, then they reply by their presence. If we look deeply beyond our thought into the direct experience of the perception of things and not our ideas about the perception of things, Things reply. The flame is saying, I do not come from anywhere. This is true of us too. When we look deeply at our own essential nature, we do not come from anywhere. The bits and pieces may, you know, accrue and disaccrue, but our essential nature does not come from anywhere. When we ask the question, where were you before your parents were born? Before this consciousness came into this life as birth, as, as a child, we have to look directly into consciousness to see the nature of consciousness. We have to look directly into life to see the nature of life. We only know life. We only know consciousness. We are not born or destroyed. We do not exist or not exist. It's just the way things are. It's just the essential, true nature. And that's what we're here for Sashen to see. This would be the answer of the Japonica flowers also. They were not the same and not different. They did not come, this, this is an earlier analogy he was talking about. Another thing he says here. I'm now writing a Dharma book. It is made of my understanding and my practice. When I write a Dharma book, I'm also not going in a linear direction. I am. Not, he's not writing the book kind of thinking of the words and just writing it linearly. He says, I'm going out into you. I am being born in different forms in you. The words that he is writing, the words that I am speaking, are the words that you're hearing. His wisdom is being reborn, being awoken in you. As we become wise, as we have insight, as we taste the nature of reality, that taste is exactly the same taste as all of the Buddhas and ancestors. There is one taste. When we taste, have even a glimpse, have a sip, have a single candle light, in the light of a million years, in the darkness of a million years, that light is the same light, same flavor. It's what the Buddha saw. And so the great master Muman, in the first case of the Muman Khan, Buddha, the gateless gate, the Khan Mu, he says, when you have a sense of this, you are walking hand in hand with all of the great masters of our tradition. It's not about, I'll have some experience and then that will be the case. It's more about, I will recognize that the Buddha, the greatest enlightened being of the world, and all of the great masters, and me, have exactly, and have always had exactly the same nature. It's a matter of recognition, not a matter of insight. Not a matter, if I work really hard, I'll get the insight. In a way, at a certain point, Working really hard is extremely important, extremely important that we put our every single ounce of energy into practice. At another point, that gets in the way. At another point, 
the very effort to try to see something else that's in the way. That's why we have individual meetings with people, because people are in different places. And everybody in the room gets different, different advice according to their particular practice. It's different uh, suggestions, because everybody's states of mind is so different. Even though our essential nature is whole, complete, lacking nothing, and everybody has it in full measure. No matter having or not having, it's just the way it is. At this very moment, we are being born and we are dying. We are being reborn, not in one single form, but in many forms. I would like you to imagine a firecracker. When you light a firecracker, it does not go down a vertical direction. It goes out in many directions. The sparks go out in all directions. So do not think that you only go out in one direction. You are like fireworks. You go out into your children, into your friends, into your society, into your whole world. When one person has an aspiration to be a benefit that goes out in all directions. Thich Nhat Hanh is one person who had an aspiration to be a benefit, and his going out in all directions has benefited countless numbers of people. His happened to be a very public way. Ours is different. The way that we affect the whole world is in accordance with our particular karma. It's not comparison to him or anybody else. It's just when we have the aspiration for goodness, when we have the aspiration for awakening, when we have the aspiration for wholesomeness, and we bring that into our world, it affects our entire world. This is the foundation of the first bodhisattva precept. Beings are numberless. I vow to free them. On a relative level, we can say I free them from myself and all that sort of stuff. But on a more fundamental level, the whole world is my own mind. The whole world is my view of the whole world. And when I shift that view from a view of darkness and defectiveness and brokenness to a view of the unbounded magnificence, the unbounded generosity, the unbounded life that is coming forward all the time, born, transforming, disappearing, born, transforming, disappearing, then we change and affect the entire world. We don't change it into some image we have in our head. We change it because our view, as, Tikna, as uh, Mr. Gadara said right in the beginning, our view creates the whole world. The sun, the moon, the stars, all are inside of our view. We are not inside of that view. This fundamental shift is part of practice. This fundamental shift from I and my view, not my so much personal view, but I and the, the absolute awareness of my being affects the entire world. There's a shift. We're turning over from our self-centered mind into true reality. Thich Nhat Hanh continues, In the morning when I do sitting meditation, to my left and to my right are monks. I have been reborn in them by sitting with them. If you look carefully, you will see me in them. I am not wanting to be reborn after I die. I am being reborn in this moment. I want to be reborn in a good direction. I want to hand on to my lay and monastic friends the most beautiful and happy things of my life so they can have good rebirth for me and for themselves. Our ignorance and anger and despair should not be reborn. When they are reborn, they bring more darkness and suffering into the world. The more happiness and love that can be reborn, the better, because it will make this world more beautiful and kind. Therefore, you and I should be living our weeks, days, months, and hours in order to be reborn constantly as kindness and love. We are here to see this for ourselves. And of course, the first day we get caught in all of our stuff. That's the way it is. But the sooner we can begin to view all this junk, this negative thinking, this, this inner critic, this self-centered view, as just you know, 
Stop. And don't give it a lot of attention. Look directly into awareness itself. Using our particular method, you'll touch the place of freedom. Touch the place of liberation. And when we are grateful, we share. Please may each of you touch your heart's essence, the deep truth of your being. And then in our own, in your own, in my own, inadequate, imperfect, incomplete way, share that. Whoever we come in contact with. Exhaustible. I love.